So hello everybody, this is uh, Sunday, December 3rd, and I will continue in this episode of Age of Gaia to um, read a few chapters from my first book of the Isa trilogy, uh, Isa, Son of the Sun. So thank you for joining and thank you for listening. The rest of the book, as well as the sequel, um, Miran, Daughter of the Moon, is available through Amazon. The third book in the series will be available soon. It's already published, or it will be published um, in a month or so. And so that is also going to be available soon. All right, so here we go. So chapter 26, Human Love. And what if woman, asked Isa, how can it be, as the Buddhists speak, that women exist in this world only as a distraction from Mara, the great illusionist? The Jains wanted nothing to do with the senses, and their path is a path of denial. But does this make them happy? Is worldly happiness an illusion? Would illusion exist in the form of this deep pleasure I've sometimes experienced in my senses, this joy I have felt in my heart. Isa shared with Chetanath about his meeting with Marie in Magadha and of the conflicting feelings he had experienced within him. Chetanath smiled. My son, these are things nobody can teach you. The flame of love burns in your heart. Is love also not also of the light. There are those who speak of worldly senses as a distraction from the path of light. And it is true that while the mind is fixed on the pleasures of sense objects, there is no breath for seeking the great light that unifies all. But when the mind is fixed on the great light, how can these pleasures exist outside of this light? No, there is only an enhancement and fulfillment of spirit as it courses through these bodies of matter. For is not the destiny of spirit to be manifested fully in matter, as is the destiny of matter to be embraced fully in spirit? You have not allowed yourself in all these years of spiritual questioning or questing to enter fully into the world of human love. But there is a gift in the creation of human form where the spiritual senses become enhanced through the refined understanding of pleasure and love, where this love becomes a pathway for a deeper realization of the great light, and where this light becomes incarnated through a nervous system blazing with the power of human love. I do not speak of an image of love which is needy and dependent on another, but a mature love that enhances and purifies each other. It is not a love that distracts or takes away, but a love that joyfully unites body and soul. Love is brought on your path because you're here to teach of love. All expressions of love are sacred. It is not human love or human senses or the human body that is illusion nor indeed matter itself that is illusion. The illusion exists in the belief that all this can exist separate from spirit, separate from the great light. There are those who spend their lives in the hedonistic pursuit of physical senses, who have denied the spirit that joins the two bodies of light. This is the illusion, the distraction that your Buddhist monks have warned about. But there are those who believe in celibacy who have denied the body and denied the exuberance of life that animates the body. Is this not also an illusion? Follow the path of your destiny, my son, wherever it leads you. I foresee that this path will not be an easy one and that there may be struggles along the way until such a time as you have found your peace with it. You will find your own way through these struggles 
and perhaps you will find that the struggles themselves have become a way of guidance for many. Chapter 27, Home to Kashmir. Chetanath became for Isa, the teacher he had long awaited. He spent many blissful months with him in his Himalayan cave, sharing his simple life, meditating with him and learning from him in their nightly conversations. But the time eventually came when he knew it was time to move on. He turned his footsteps now towards Srinagar, where his mother awaited him along with his Kashmiri kin. He wasn't far now. It had been 10 years since they had parted at the coast, at the court of Samayim in Persia, and he had traveled the length and breadth of India during that time. Now he looked forward to seeing her again. He missed her quiet wisdom and restful presence. It was a long journey, passing through several wide valleys and snow-capped mountains. At this time of the year, however, the going was easy, and there were plants and berries along the way to sustain him, with many little mountain streams to provide water. There were an astonishing variety of flowers of every color, and in some places it was like walking on a soft, springy carpet of red, yellow, pink, and violet hues as far as the eye could see. During older times, the valleys of Kashmir had been home to many tribes, such as the Nagas, Tukharas, Ishakas, Sakas, and Gandharas, who came from the north and from the west. During the Assyrian period, the Israeli tribes from north of the Jordan were also relocated to the regions of Kashmir and Afghanistan where they blended with the local tribes. In fact, the name Kashmir derives from one of the Israeli tribes, Kush or Kash. Today, the Kashmiris are a race of tall, robust people with aquiline noses, comprising many different ethnic backgrounds, many of them very similar to the Semitic people in the land of Palestine, but also mixed in blood with races from the north. This was the land of Isa's ancestry, and although this was going to be his first visit there, he had heard many stories about the land and people from Yusuf and Maryam. Kashmir was comprised of a number of kingdoms in those times, one of them built around the garden city of Srinagar, constructed on the banks of the exquisite, of the exquisitely beautiful Dal Lake. As he neared Srinagar, he passed by the Takte Suleiman, or seat of Suleiman, which had been built by the first Yehudi refugees from Assyria in honor of their arrival here. And now Isa was getting nervous. He had learned that Yusuf had left on one of his long trips, along with his son by Marita Graba, Yaakov, visiting his brother, King Gondifaris, in Takshashila, and then on to the tin mines of Britannia. He wondered how Mariam was fast faring. Where would he find them? And how were all his brothers and sisters doing? He had changed so much during his travels. How would it be to see each other after these long years? He need not have worried. Mariam had been informed by the guards about a blue-eyed stranger who had entered the city gates who looked exactly like Thomas, and she had known instantly that it was Isa. She came running to him out from the palace, wrapping him in a long embrace as he strode into the city. He had grown into a tall, handsome young man, although looking a bit wild from his months in the Kashmiri wilderness. He still had the same intense look in his eyes that she remembered from his youth. Mother and son embraced each other tenderly for a long time, silently and tearfully. Come, my son, she finally said, as she held his hand to lead him up towards the palace. We have many years 
to catch up. I heard Abba and Yaakov are away, and I'm sorry, Isa said. I would like to have seen them again, too. They are never far from you. Don't you think they have all kept a close watch over you these many years? Isa noticed that they were walking right up to the palace gates, the guards and servants greeting Mariam with folded hands. A gesture extended to him also as her newly returned son. His, his questioning look was met with a twinkling smile. Wait till you're inside, Beta, and let's get a full meal inside you first. Mariam introduced Isa to his new sister, Leah, who scampered nearby, shy at first, but inquisitive and surprisingly at ease. And of course, it was good to see Thomas and Yosas and Yenbi. They were all eager to spend time with him after all these years and to hear his stories. But Mariam wanted him all to herself first, after he had washed, eaten, and dressed into the new silk attire provided for him. She and Isa sat by themselves in a secluded corner of the palace gardens. He had been telling her the story of his travels, his journeys through the Sim, South India, Lanka, and Magadha. He told her of the years he spent as a monk in Puri, his time with Marie, his experiences in Varanasi and Kapilavastu, and then finally his experiences with Chetanath. Day had passed into night, and they continued to talk in Mariam's chambers inside the palace. Mariam revealed to him how she had also met Chetanath on a couple of occasions. And in fact, it was he who had given her advance warning of her son's arrival. He would show up as needed, for he had mastered the yogic art of bilocation and could simply come and go as he pleased. And then it was her turn. There's much we haven't told you about yourself, Isa. You needed to discover your spiritual roots first, before you were ready to hear more about your earthly origins and mission. You know that your uncle, Gondaphoris, is the ruler of Gandhara and is your father's brother. Does it surprise you to know that your father, Yusuf, belongs to the ruling family of Kash? Here in Kashmir, he is known as Megabahana, she concluded. Isa took some time to digest this information. Yes, I have heard this, he answered. And I've been putting things together for myself as well. It was wise of you to withhold this information from me earlier because it could easily have become a distraction. But now I'm afraid it becomes a burden and an expectation. I do not wish anything to do with thrones and rulership, Ma, only to travel the path of my inner light. Mariam smiled. We will speak more of this later, later. But let me continue with some matters at hand. Gondaforas and Megavana have been spending much time traveling up the Silk Road and into Gaul and Britannia together, strengthening their ties with other nations along the trade routes. Meanwhile, your father has once again appointed his half-brother, Jayendra, as the chief minister to rule here in his stead. A shadow passed across her face, which she tried to hide unsuccessfully from Isa. You will meet him soon. You don't like him? asked Isa. Mariam smiled. You don't miss much, she observed. But let's not talk up, not but let's not talk about that yet. You've had a long journey and need to rest. And I need to see to Leah. She led him to a room that had been prepared for him, with luxurious bedspreads and decorative silks, overlooking a marble fountain in the gardens that glowed in the light of candles along the path. It was a stark contrast with the ascetic life he had lived for so long.
Chapter 28 Art of Governance Isa and Mariam spent much time together over the next few days, often riding out into the glorious meadows surrounding the valley, where they could talk freely and reconnect the threads of their lives. Your father is the hereditary ruler of the small kingdom, she told him one day. He is a descendant of King David, as are you. How does that work when he's away so much? asked Isa. The chief minister looks after most everyday affairs, said Mariam, and it is a tradition that the kings and queens use their royal influence to cultivate ties with neighboring kingdoms, including trade agreements. Your father wishes to spend time in Palestine because that is where the other branch of our ancestors still resides. And he felt it was important for him, as well as for you, to create stronger links with the Yehudis, who were once the enemies of the Beni Israel. You know, of course, that you will one day be king. And therefore, it has been important for you to travel the land. But what if I don't want to be king? Isa interrupted. I feel my calling as a spiritual teacher, not as a political leader. Look at Siddhartha. He left his kingdom behind because he realized his kingdom wasn't of this world. Yes, and look at King Ashoka, who remained a king and follower of Buddha, who was responsible for spreading the teaching of the Buddha throughout the known world. And look at your uncle, Gondaforas, who was ruler of Gandhara, but has pledged his primary allegiance to the way of Dhamma, which is nonviolence in peace. And your own father, who although he has spent many years away from his kingdom, continues to hold the reins of responsibility for the economic as well as spiritual well-being of his people. Mariam realized that if this were his path, then the calling would have to come from within. He had been on the road for many long years, and she knew it couldn't be easy to shape his mind around the responsibilities of kingship when his feet were itchy for the kind of freedom enjoyed by a renunciate monk. A few days later, however, he saw himself approached Mariam. You are right, Ma, he stated as he started. I have always equated freedom with the path of renunciation, but I realized I was also equating freedom with the lack of responsibilities. And maybe it is true that freedom and responsibility don't have to be mutually exclusive. Beta, didn't you tell me a few days ago that enlightenment means not being identified with the personal self anymore and that you would simply become a flute through which the wind could play its song? So whose freedom, whose responsibility are you referring to? What happened? to the way of the river. Do you think that if you gave yourself up to a higher calling, that you would ever have to give up anything? True, said Isa, humbled by his mother's purity of heart. It is only the personal self who worries about illusory freedoms. He sighed deeply. All right, ma, what do you want me to do? How do you feel about being apprentice to Jayendra for some time? As you know, he has been serving as king while your father is away. And perhaps this would give you an opportunity to see what this entails. Again, Isa felt a shadow at the mention of Jayendra's name. And he questioned Mariam about this. He is kind to me because I'm his half-brother's wife. And he is good to you because you are my son. She suspected that he would try to usurp Isa's rightful place on the throne, but did not wish to alarm him needlessly. Perhaps this is all that matters for now, she said. In the course of time, Isa was given the responsibility of being an assistant minister to Jayendra and to the kingdom of Kash, learning by observing and practicing about the art of governance. 
Chapter 29, Niran. Pahalgam was a beautiful valley, a few days ride east from Srinagar. At about 7,000 feet elevation, it was the seat of another small Kashmiri kingdom. This region of India had the distinction of being a melting pot of many different ethnic and cultural origins, which revealed itself in the physical characteristics of the Kashmiri people. The Beni Israel who had originated from Palestine had mingled with the Saka, the Tukhara, and other tribal influences and comprised some of the finest specimens of humanity. Miran was 14 years old when Isa first arrived in Kashmir from his travels through the lands of Palestine, Persia, and India. As the only child of the royal couple, she had been raised in wealth and splendor, having everything she could ever want. In a land where the women were known for their beauty, she was considered exceptionally beautiful, with intelligent green eyes and a clear, finely chiseled face that portrayed her sensitive and inquisitive spirit. She remembered clearly when a young man named Isa first paid a visit to her parents, the king and queen of that small valley, along with his mother, Mariam, who was a princess in the neighboring valley kingdom. He had not ignored her, as most grown men would have done, but asked him about herself, her interests in life, her hopes, and her dreams for the future. She felt a peace and vibrancy emanating from him as he listened to her, and within a short time felt completely at ease with them in a way that she hadn't felt with many people. He would come from time to time, and she was excited to show him around the gardens, introducing him to the squirrels that lived among the old pines and the birds that chattered in the bushes and trees. She was an only child, and by nature, reclusive. But she found she could talk with them about questions she had never asked herself before, and was thrilled to listen to his stories about the travels he had made. As the years went by, Isa would continue to visit from time to time, and always managed to find some time with Iran on these occasions. She remembered once, when it was just turning spring, and a party of them, including Isa and his mother, were riding out into a magical valley filled with flowers. They had stopped by a stream to eat, when a young doe had burst out from the forest, where she was being chased by predators, and came straight towards Isa, who stretched out his hands and soothed her trembling body until the danger had passed. Miran felt like that doe sometimes. She trusted him completely, and something about his presence soothed a restless longing in her for a purpose she could not yet understand. And as the years passed, she recognized that the trust and excitement she felt around him was maturing into womanly love. She could feel him even when he was far away and knew that somehow their lives were intertwined. She had a dream once where she found Isa sitting by the fountain in her palace garden. She ran out to embrace him and in the, embra in the embrace found herself being taken out of her body into higher dimensions of light. This is the key to your freedom, Isa had said, handing her a golden key. And then she had found herself traveling out through luminous worlds of infinite beauty and joy, the vibrancy of her being filling the universe. She awoke with waves of ecstasy pouring through her body, knowing that she wanted nothing other than this in her life. Chapter 30. During the summers, when he could take some time away from his duties as assistant minister to Jayendra, Isa would go away to visit his teacher, Chetanath, 
whom he simply called Babaji, uh, spending months with them, meditating and exploring the deeper teachings of the Nath tradition. He had learned about the physical aspects of healing from the Essenes, the use of herbs and potions, working with the angels of steam, water, and clay, harnessing the power of breath to focus one's life force. He had learned about using the power of mantras and yantras from the Brahmins. He had learned about connecting with the consciousness of the body and the subconscious mind from the Buddhists. Now, Chetanath felt he so was ready to learn about something only the Nath yogis knew, the ability to open up a passage from the physical body to the subtlest bodies of light so that the infinite power of the Atma could be accessed by one in physical form. The Atma is clothed with five bodies, he told Isa one day. The first two bodies you're well aware of. The Annamaya Kosha is the body of flesh, and the Pranamaya Kosha is the body of breath that feeds and animates it. Your Essene teachers worked primarily with these. Beyond this is the Mannamaya Kosha, the sheath of mind and motion, along with the wisdom body, Vinyanamaya Kosha. When your heart and mind are still, and you engage the realm of the higher mind through mantras, chants, and prayers, you release the power of the word. This is the power invoked by the rishis for blessing and healing. He paused to let his words sink in. Beyond this sheath is the Anandamaya Kosha, which we simply call the light body, constructed with the lightest of all substance as a direct emanation of the Atma. It is only the heart that is selfless and completely dedicated in service to life that can access this. And that too, only after a great deal of preparation and training. Isa recalls some of his travels with Chetanath through nearby villages, where he had cured people simply through the power of his touch. He remembered also a time when a child had fallen ill and died. His teacher had recognized that there was a destiny still remaining to be fulfilled and had brought him back to life. Babuji's entire being had become suffused with a golden glow, and it was as if the light of the whole world had been concentrated through his compassionate touch. Yes, smiled Chetanath, knowing what Isa was thinking. This is why it is called on the Mayakosha, the bliss body. When you invoke the power of the light body, you are attuning to the realms beyond all the veils of separation and duality. Here, there is only the beauty and power of the infinite Atma, unified with all the worlds of creation in unqualified bliss. When you are attuned with the light body, you simply become this divine presence, Aham Brahmasmi, and all the power of creation flows through you. And how is this different from the enlightened state? asked Isa. Many of his Hindu and Buddhist teachers had spoken about enlightenment, about moksha or nirvana, the end of the spiritual journey, the end of all seeking. Enlightenment is not the end, it is only the beginning of the journey, responded Chetanath paradoxically. It is not an experience you achieve after long years of arduous discipline, nor a state of consciousness that sets you aside from the rest of creation. Enlightenment is simply the abiding awareness of who you are as the Atma, said Chetanath. Once you become aware of your essential identity as Atma, you can never be trapped again in the veils of Maya. There is a sense of identity that comes from the Mandamaya Kosha, the mental ego, representing all the thoughts, feelings, memories, and experiences of this entity 
known as Isan. But this is a reflected identity, like the light of the moon, continually changing, feeble, and impermanent. The Atma is like the light of the sun that is sourced within itself, changeless, unlimited, unborn, and deathless. It is the light that permeates the universe, creates the universe, and yet exists as a whole and complete outside the universe as well, beyond the matrix of time and space, beyond the realm of Maya. This is the light that you are. This is the light that shines through the Anandamaya Kosha. The Buddha realized this after long seeking. Now the seeking was only to return at long last to his own doorstep, exhausting all his own ideas and concepts about enlightenment, all the religious conditioning that defined enlightenment as the, as the ultimate experience, and allowing himself to simply abide in the light which already existed within. The divine presence is always already present. It was simply a matter of shifting his focus from the apparent identity generated by the manna ekosha to the self-existing presence of the Atma and abiding there long enough for this realization to become permanent. Enlightenment is not such a big mystery, although many have confused themselves. How do you teach a fish to find water? How do you teach a turtle to breathe air? Awareness of this presence is something we're all born with. But then you become conditioned to believe that you are this human personality, this mental ego, this mandamaya kosha that the Atma has clothed itself with. You define yourself by your name, your qualities, your experiences in the world of time. You build a life based on your dreams for a future, conditioned by your fears from the past. You learn that you must struggle to achieve something, to become what you are meant to be. And this endless struggle becomes the root of all your attachments and suffering. As my pupil Siddhartha also discovered. Chetanath was, this belief in yourself that the separate ego is itself maya. And as soon as you recognize this illusion for what it is, it dissolves. You recognize that you already and always have been that which you are searching for. The mental ego recognizes itself as a reflection of the eternal self. And as suddenly as that, the search is over. Yes, it is just that simple, he emphasized. Although it takes time for this realization of the self to become an abiding awareness. Once this awareness becomes an abiding presence, you are no longer trapped in the desires and expectations generated by the mental ego. You are no longer controlled by the vasanas, the matrix of subconscious conditioning that keeps you trapped in desperation and fear. You drink of the living waters of the vast universe and the universe works with you. The fish in the water is not thirsty. So there we are for today. So thank you for joining and listening. Um, and we'll see you again uh, next week. And meanwhile, please free, feel free to uh, look for this and other books on Amazon. And also look for earlier readings on my Facebook page, Kiara Windrider. And they're also archived on Age of Gaia. On the, on the Conscious Awakening Network. Um, there's many, many different channels, many different hosts on the Conscious Awakening Network that you might wish to follow up on. 
just uh, go to the website and look for um, all the different categories that exist. So thank you again for joining me here. Blessings and love.